Good evening, my name is Paul Weinhold. I'm the president and CEO of the University of Oregon Foundation. The foundation is independent from the university and one of our chief responsibilities is to invest for its long-term benefit. Our plan for the Riverfront District is not an extension of campus. Instead, we see a local investment with an opportunity to create a vibrant space that contributes to the vitality of our community. We've assembled a development team of local and regional talent. These people were specifically chosen for their expertise, professional experience, and history of working together. We share a passion for developing this unique property and transforming it into a breathtaking community district along the Willamette River. You have full bios, and you can hear more from them later as a brief introduction. They are Hal Ferris, Hugh Pritchard, John Round, Margo Long, Mark Mixes, and Harris Hoffman, Greg Brokow. We also have two people who are not with us today. We have Karin Knudsen from Brown Brokow Architects and Jane Namiet uh, from the U of O Foundation, who's our Chief Investment Officer. They both played a major role in getting us here, but they were unable to attend because of some previous travel commitments. Throughout our presentation, you'll hear common themes, transformation, long-term financial commitment, local ownership, local expertise, and local relationships. We believe these are the key factors that set us apart and uniquely qualify us to be a partner with you and the community on this one-of-a-kind redevelopment project. People have asked, why is the foundation interested in the eWeb property? The board and foundation leadership believe that this is an incredible opportunity to invest in our local community, an investment that will create a vibrant and transformational extension of downtown Eugene. Your question one asks, how will decisions be made? The answer is simple all decisions will be made locally. The Board of Trustees of the Foundation have granted the authority, the full authority to the Foundation leadership to purchase the eWeb property at a fair market value. And we have a governance structure in place that will allow, allow quick decision making and immediate action on all phases of the development. If we are chosen as the master developer, we intend to use the financial strength of the Foundation, the expertise of our trustees, the vast talent of our team, and our business and professional relationships to their full advantage. Add to that our passion, our passion to create a legacy for a landmark destination in Eugene. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our development manager, Hal Ferris. Thank you, Paul. We are fortunate to have the foundation as the owner and capital partner that has the capital and wherewithal to see the development of the River District through to completion. The foundation is here today they'll be here tomorrow, and they'll be here in the future. The foundation will always take the best interest of the community to heart. What is good for the community is good for the foundation. This is rare in commercial real estate today, which is dominated by institutional investors that have an investment horizon of three to five years before they sell to another institution. The return on equity from the institutional investor goes out of this community to the, to the community where those investors uh, live or where they're founded. The, Foundation is here. The return on investment that is realized by the foundation stays in this community to further the mission of the foundation, which helps the Eugene community and the university. Our team, as part of question number one, you have asked us to address the experience of our team working together. Our development team members, Harris, Hugh, and I, have worked together for 20 years. Harris and I were partners at Lorig Associates, where we accomplished several, several large, notable developments. During that time, Hugh Richard worked very closely with us, bringing in private capital, providing community outreach, having a touch and feel with the neighborhood, and bringing businesses into the developments that we created. Eugene has, been, has benefited from the history of our team together. In addition, Mark Mix is sitting next to me, has worked in Eugene for over 10 years on a variety of different development projects. And during that time, he has worked extensively with Raul Brokaw, as a design team member on the projects that they worked with in the past and they're working with now. In addition, PWL, Fargo, has worked with Raul Brokaw on a variety of projects as well, including the development of the master plan for eWeb for the River District. Together, we bring a wonderful mix of regional experience, large-scale neighborhood development, and local knowledge of this community, contractors, and business contacts. Another question that was asked by the board was for us to provide examples of similar projects that are similar in scale and complexity as what's envisioned for the redevelopment of the eWeb property to create the River District. We have three very good examples. 
First is Thornton Creek. This is in the Northgate area in Seattle. Prior to its redevelopment, it was a 10-acre site, a sea of black asphalt that was occasionally populated by white tent sales. Uh, it now has 600 residential units, including retire a retirement development uh, piece. The total project was over $180 million in development. Part of the project included daylighting Thornton Creek, which was buried in a park in a pipe below the asphalt parking lot to create a nice green belt. And we worked closely with the city of Seattle to create that, um, that development. Obviously, there's some similarities with this, uh, the waterfront site here in Eugene to this development. In addition, we worked with Metro to develop a parking garage that served the entire community, including transit riders that could use the parking when the residents and the businesses of the, of the development itself did not need it. And we uh, installed new city streets and other infrastructure, public amenities for the development. Our second development example is Salishan. This 180-acre site, 10 times the size of the River District, was developed in three phases. We partnered with the Tacoma Housing Authority as the master developer. It's a $225 million total project, which will result in 2,000 units of mixed income for sale and for rent housing. <coughs> New parks, streets, infrastructure, and community centers were all part of the redevelopment of the Salishan neighborhood. And Harris will talk in greater detail about some of these projects and his part of our proposal. The third example, which we think has the most similarity to the e-website and the future river district, is West Campus Village at the University of Washington. This 16-acre site was made up of small apartment buildings, parking lots, uh, and tired 60, 60s era residential dormitories. It is now a vibrant, urban, transit oriented, mixed use neighborhood with grocery store, restaurants, parks, fitness centers, coffee shops, and a variety of public amenities, including installation of new city streets and other city infrastructure. A total of 1.4 million square feet, $474 million dollars, Developed in three phases, we are just now completing the last two buildings out of 12 total buildings that were part of the West Campus Village. It took, it's taken eight years, which is a rapid pace uh, from the time we started our planning until the last building will be built. One characteristic that West Campus Village has that will not be shared with the River District is the uh, development of student housing. Our observation is that you have plenty of student housing in downtown <laughs> Eugene now, and we don't think we need to add any more dedicated student housing to the downtown neighborhood. So with that, I'd like to share, to pass it over to Hugh, we'll share our vision of economic vitality and share some exciting news that we have for you today. Thanks, Al. I'm Hugh Pritchard, a U of O alum, and I've lived in the same house in Eugene for 42 years. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to address your question number two, which asks, how will our development build on Eugene's economy and market strengths to create a landmark destination that builds a legacy for the future? We love this question. I'll answer with three of our past Eugene developments. We're sure that the key to long-term success is to build on Eugene's uniqueness, that is to celebrate and strengthen what is we're already doing well here. Now, every city is unique, but we know that Eugene is uniquely unique. <laughs> we do things our own way. We have twilight meets on a world-class track. Look at those faces. We have health, uh, uh, local rituals. <laughs> we have healthy traditions. International reach. We're quirky. We're moving. Uh, this was last Sunday's marathon. We're outdoorsy. We're proudly this. We're beautiful in the rain. We play in our river. We love to eat by our river, and we need more choices. We have world-class wineries. We build on past successes. We have an exploding food and drink culture and time-honored success stories. We have passion, innovation, and great taste. We have bursting entrepreneurism, cool Eugene-made businesses, creative collaborations, a highly educated workforce, and we enjoy science. <laughs> <laughs> to capitalize on all of this momentum, we will do what we've always done in the past. We focus on local. Local investors and entrepreneurs understand both the opportunities and challenges 
of business in Eugene, and they've become strong allies. We're fully experienced in working with regional and national tenants, but feel the River District is foremost about unique Eugene. In the 90s, we created a whole new model for downtown living, Broadway Place. It anchored the west end of downtown with dense, beautiful housing, commercial uses, and an almost invisible 750-car parking garage underneath. There was nothing like it in Oregon outside of downtown Portland, and it worked. We always pushed the envelope and create something new. When we built the U.S. Bank Building at 8th and Willamette, there had been no new private buildings in downtown for over 25 years. Our first tenant was then startup Bagelsphere, which has since gone on to open three more locations. And currently the ground floor is also home to a Eugene favorite, Off the Waffle. We accomplished this by partnering with local investors and businesses who wanted to boost downtown to do something different and, and better. And that's exactly how we proceed in the River District. At Broadway Place, we brought in 10 Eugene families for 100% local ownership. Likewise, at US Bank, we succeeded in all local ownership. And we built these two large projects and one other with local general contractors. My third Eugene example is Lincoln School. This school had been abandoned for years and literally left to rot. We transformed it into 59 unique apartments and succeeded in getting it on the National Register of Historic Places. It is now privately owned as individual condominiums. As part of this public-private partnership, we donated land west of the school to the city of Eugene for use as playgrounds and community garden space. We also did donated the land in front so the city could move in another historic building, the McNeil Riley House, which serves as a community meeting place. You have two wonderful old buildings on your property which we would love to work on. For the past several weeks, using your master plan for talking points, we've been meeting with a variety of Eugenians to talk about the River District and partnership possibilities. Tonight, we're totally excited to tell you that Ed King, founder of King Estate Winery, is proposing an awesome use for the historic Bow Trust building. He envisions a production winery, tasting room, microbrew, and a restaurant. When we think of what King Estate has done for the local wine industry, it's hard to overstate how valuable their presence will be as an anchor for the River District. We can't wait to work with King Estate to make this a reality. In addition, our housing mix will include affordable housing, and we have met with Cornerstone Community Housing, not to be confused with Capstone. <laughs> we partnered with Cornerstone in the past and would love to work with them again to provide housing in the, in the River District. We met with other local developers who are interested in specific types and uses, such as hotel or incubator office space, and we're talking to local businesses who are succeeding and talking about expansion. It's an exciting time for Eugene, Thank you. I'd like to introduce John Rob. Thanks, you. Uh, question in your question three, you ask how we will clarify and implement the development plan, and uh, we'd like to be clear that our development plan is built on the concepts of the master plan. It's a good plan, flexible. Uh, most importantly, it captures a really great vision that this community shares and is widely supported in the community. Uh, Margo was, uh, we were the team that did the master plan, and Margo was a key part of that and brings uh, fabulous experience from literally all over the world, but importantly in the Northwest, which is going to talk about some of the keys to implementing a plan like this. Thanks, John. Um, so, uh, not to sound repetitive, but I also am a UMO uh, graduate. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't tell you what year I graduated, but um, I did graduate in landscape architecture. Um, and um, our firm, PWL Partnership, are landscape architects and urban designers. And um, we have had the opportunity to work on many uh, waterfront projects over the past 30 years. And what what we, these projects have become recognized um, award-winning projects that um, exemplify city building, community building, uh, healthy cities, and above all, um, sustainable urbanism. And one of the main principles of this uh, master plan was embedding sustainable urbanism uh, 
in, into Eugene. So um, our presentation here will focus on how the peace attitudes. How these um, how these attributes of sustainable urban, urbanism will be implemented into the uh, development plan. Um, this project is a, a lead neighborhood, a lead platinum neighborhood project in Vancouver called Southeast Wall Street. And part of uh, a big part of what we do is um, ensure that uh, we build great public realms. The public realms um, bring value to development sites. They bring economical value and they also bring social value. Um, and good public realms, um, a, a good public realm. Uh, looks at uh, how people use the spaces, uh, people of all ages, people of all gender, and people um, of all different demographics. So we believe that um, this social and economical value that's brought to this project uh, is really important. Also, um, we'll also look at the street network. The streets are another part of the important public realm. And we'll look at the streets and the right-of-ways from building edge to building edge, looking at um, all aspects of the pub public realm so that there's, um, they're used in a multitude of ways. The streets, we see them used not only just for traffic, but they're, the streets will be built in this project as living streets and complete streets, um, serving uh, the environment from an ecological standpoint, a biodiversity standpoint, um, a green infrastructure standpoint, as well as um, social and uh, building infrastructure integrated. Even though um, we don't have the ability to introduce or to um, daylight the mill race, we will, uh, it's, it's, it, it's important, um, history in Eugene is very important. And so what we want to make sure is that uh, we're working with the open space that uh, is recycling stormwater, um, using uh, wastewater if we, if we have it, and integrating that, that green infrastructure element into the development project. We will design streets as important um, and green structures that also reflect how um, the public spaces can be used. The green infrastructure is one aspect of the development process that we're going to be doing, but also the, it also it also plays an important part for um, play environments for uh, people of all ages. Um, the master plan will also talk about cultural landscapes. We have a, a number of uh, artifacts, industrial artifacts on this site that can be integrated, like this um, uh, project in Southeast Wall Street can be here as well. As in uh, this lead, uh, another lead uh, neighborhood uh, project in Victoria called Dockside Green, um, we will utilize stormwater uh, for cleansing and reinterpret the mill race to ensure it becomes an integral part of the development that addresses both in green infrastructure and public realm. The River District is all about connecting the downtown to the river. Um, one of the most recently completed projects we've done is in New Westminster, where a uh, very similar scale of project and uh, waterfront park, where we connected um, uh, cross rail tracks very similar to um, the e website here in revitalizing. And the, the park now has revitalized the downtown and is uh, spurring on development from private parcels as well as civic parcels. This is a model that we think will work really well um, in Eugene. We look forward to the opportunity of working closely with um, the city and bringing some of our expertise to make sure that the waterfront um, park can be developed at an early stage through the process. Um, we're presently working in the same capacity and same model for the other Vancouver, in Vancouver, Washington, um, <laughs> where we, um, First worked for a number of years with the developer, and we're now working for the city to uh, uh, through the process of developing their riverfront plan, and that's on the Columbia River. This we know that um, it's important to touch the water, and this project has become so successful because of everyone's ability to get down and touch the water. This image also, I think, this project also shows the importance of 
durability, um, uh, environmental, ecological sensitivity, um, and creating great public spaces for, for people. Um, these, when, when public spaces work, they become memorable, they become, um, they're integrated, they become contextual, and they will help make the River District a really successful project. We, as a team, can make that happen for you. So the, it's pretty clear that the, the landscape, the streets, the sidewalks, uh, the buildings together make the urban place making opportunity that we need to accomplish it uh, at, in the River District. And we got a good example. We were involved in uh, Crescent Village in North Eugene. And it's a place that is activated by the buildings. There are streets that you want to walk down. Uh, next slide. It's a place to hang out. It's a people place. Uh, so we want to take you on a walk to the river and show you some of the ideas we have. And this is pretty exciting for us to um, do this and, and uh, show you some design images. This is Fifth Street Market right here. So we're starting at that dot, and then we're going to go down the new Fifth, uh, Fifth Avenue uh, to, the river, uh, to the river, and we're going to end at Restaurant Row, which is a really important part of the master plan. So uh, let's start off at the corner of Fifth and High. This is a familiar image looking from Fifth Street Market uh, uh, to the northwest. And what we're envisioning here is um, an increase in, in uh, density, of course. We're um, imagining a residential, uh, mostly residential, some commercial, really activating this corner, and most importantly, uh, drawing people into the river, uh, complementing with the Fifth Street Market and really bringing something new, extending downtown to the river. So this is a hook that draws you down fifth. We've got to get the character and the scale right, but this is a great opportunity to begin. And then as we turn the corner, uh, going down fifth, um, you can see we're proposing uh, mostly residential on the streets. not realistic to have commercial everywhere on the ground floor. So it's important that the residential engage the street and make it a good street to walk down and connect to the river. This, Im this image also shows one of the other main principles of the master plan which was to um, integrate and bring the river as a green finger back into the city. So we'll continue on under the viaduct. And as Hugh mentioned, we've got a couple of great old buildings. Here's the Bow Trust building, which was the old eWeb headquarters. And uh, we've got, uh, with Ed King's idea for and, and commitment to uh, uh, restaurant and winery uh, concept here. We've just developed an image to see what that could be like. And we're pretty excited about this. Um, uh, what's going to draw people through the viaduct? Well, this, this could be. So uh, the idea of working with existing buildings, the, the existing, the history, and then introducing new things, but most importantly, activating this place and making it a people place at the river. So the next step down the road continues and is a view of Restaurant Row, which we know is really important in the master plan. It's an important part of the vision. Uh, we embrace that. Uh, and we've heard a lot about, OK, you make a great people place. I want to live here. And so we're talking about uh, significant residential along step back from the river with great views. We're talking about apartments, condominiums, a great mix of housing, a great place to live. This image, along with the next one, really shows the importance of integrating the public spaces with the private spaces and the semi-private spaces. It, we, we believe that these will all be seamless. And uh, this, this image shows the, um, the restaurants uh, right on the edge of the uh, public walkway and then right on the edge of the uh, park. We also know from experience that integrating bikes and dogs into developments probably the most challenging thing to do, but also becomes the most rewarding thing for most people. So in the background, you also see the um, steam plant. And we believe that working with the existing um, artifacts again and infrastructure will really resonate with this project and is important. So the, the uh, idea of, of a beer on the river, of meeting a friend for dinner, that's the key. Uh, that's the ultimate promise. And, and, uh, Really, uh, it's about people coming together and having fun. And uh, this is another image of one of Margo's projects in Van Vancouver, Coal Harbor. And that, just the delight in the place is what we're after. So we've, uh, we've looked at Fifth, but there's another important street. That's 8th Avenue, uh, termed a great street. And you know, just a few years ago, 
that was an aspiration. Uh, a lot of people wondered how, what, is, what does that mean? Uh, well, uh, you know, with the farmer's market, city hall, things happening at the center of town, the federal courthouse, Northwest Community Credit Union, uh, Sam Bonds, and just today the news was that Whole Foods is, this is indeed, the rumor is true that uh, Whole Foods is committed to that site. So uh, just in a couple of years, this, uh, the momentum is there. This is an important street. This can be a great street. It's the connection from Willamette Street to the Willamette River, and we see that as a really great opportunity. And ultimately, connecting through the site, looping the riverfront into the city, and connecting to the bike path is a key uh, to the success of this. Connectivity is critical to the long-term success of the River District. <clears throat> right now, the site is isolated by the railroad tracks, by the heavy arterials, large arterials that separate it from downtown. It will be critical for us to work with the vision that John has uh, communicated to build the momentum of 8th Street to come into the district and to reconnect to 5th. Uh, the long-term vision, and we need to make it easy for the bicyclists, for the pedestrians, for the automobile, for transit to come into the district, for the people of Eugene to have a reason to go through the district without having to live there or work there. It needs to be an integral part of our community. We will be working closely with the city and EWIB to get in a, a no uh, horn zone for the railroad to going through the, through the area, to relocate the railroad tracks, to make easy connections and visual connections from the city through these barriers that currently isolate the site. Um, in our long-term strategy, which is part of your question number three, is that we, we have a long-term overall build-out anticipation of about 10 years. We've identified the overall district and broken it down into three quarters. The first quarter that we have said is ready to go right now is the market quarter. And Mark will talk more about our immediate implementation plans of how we think we can move forward with that area. But while he is working with the design team on the immediate steps moving forward to the market quarter, I will be working closely with the city uh, to, to really look at the park plan along with John's team and Margo's team. The park plan, the infrastructure it's going to take to service that so that it takes a long time to get that design done, to get the engineering done, and get it built. So it's ready, and we're ready to move from the market quarter into the river quarter um, when those infrastructure pieces are in place. We can't start into the river quarter without having those critical infrastructure pieces ready to go and that visual there to create that sense of community. Then we will move um, along the way into where the steam plant is located. The, could be the last piece that could move sooner. We think this is a great opportunity, but it's full of challenges with the building. So we would like to have a long-term tenant or use of the building that really makes it seem. It's an iconic building. It will be known in Eugene for a long time, and it will be an, uh, an element that everybody can be proud of, but it's important that we get the right tenant, the right use in there. And we may come up with some interim uses that can utilize it and activate it in the short term that don't take as much capital investment until we can really put the pieces together. Right now, we see the opportunity with new market tax credits and historic tax credits, which are both federal programs that can help close the gap for what it might take for that project to come together. And with that kind of the long-term vision, I'd like to turn it over to Mark. We'll talk more about our short-term strategy and how we're going to get started. Thanks, Hal. This is my hometown. Um, my family's lived here for 43 years. Uh, I got QPs by a year on that. Um, I used to ride my bike by the uh, hog fuel pile that you guys <laughs> used to have out there, and that was a while ago. So, uh, our team has strong connections with, with this community, with this site. Um, we've been involved with this project a long time. Um, we're committed to a successful outcome. We have to get this right. We're fortunate to have a section of the site where much of the, much of the groundwork has been laid. <clears throat> it's critical to hit the ground running and maintain the momentum that eWeb has created with the master plan process to date. In looking at the market quarter, the adjacent streets are all in place. Uh, we have infrastructure. This is the logical starting point for development. Um, we're directly connected to the urban fabric of the city. Uh, Fifth Street Market is right next door, so we have commercial activity. We'll help build on that commercial activity. Um, this project will help build uh, the activity in that area. We've been waiting to have a beer on the river for a long time. <laughs> Everybody's talked about that. 
uh, we do plan to deliver on this. Uh, there's a lot of steps in the way uh, to get us to that point, uh, but it's key that we start with, with the market quarter. That'll, that'll lead us to the river. Uh, we'll begin laying the groundwork, prepare uh, for, for the development of that quarter uh, by doing detailed site research. Uh, we'll work with Ralph Roca to assemble the team of professionals. Uh, we'll partner with the local approval authorities. Um, and we'll continue to build on the trust that was created during the master planning process. We've worked with uh, the local contractors and professionals in this community and plan to do so again on this project. Uh, we have strong relationships with the city of Eugene. Uh, we've partnered with them in the past on complicated projects such as Broadway Place with uh, Hugh and Harris and Howe, and, and more recently with Crescent Village and Northwest Community Credit Union uh, with Ralph Roca. We have a strong working relationship with the city. We have a strong working relationship with UWeb and staff. We've been involved in this project for a long time and we know the people uh, at the table here tonight. Uh, we, we believe this familiarity builds trust. Um, we follow through on what we say we're going to do, uh, and that's been proven, and this creates that trust. We enjoy working with these people. Um, many of them are here tonight. No other team you've heard from can say this. Um, so we believe our local presence, our knowledge, and the trust we've built will allow us to execute quickly to ensure early successes on this project. It's rare that a public process can reach the level of consensus that happened here in Eugene with the Master Planning Project. Um, we plan to build on this work with communication and outreach that allows for the community to share in our excitement about this project. Um, we have a website that, that was just uh, launched tonight. Um, what's the address, Craig? EugeneRiverDistrict.com. So you can go there tonight. This will be a tool we'll use to reach out to the community It'll talk about what our plans are, what our vision is, and, and that's for the community to engage in this, in this project. No, no some single person has the market on good ideas. You know, the public's involvement in this project will make the project stronger. We believe good communication will cultivate opportunity. We're committed to moving the project forward quickly um, to provide the best value to EWEB and the community. And next, Harris will discuss uh, the team's experience in delivering high-value, high-quality projects working with public agencies. Thanks. Um, my name is Harris Hoffman. It's hard to compete with this group. I did move here 41 years ago, and after a short 25-year stay in Seattle, I moved back five years ago. And I'm also a University of Oregon alum. And my teammates refer to me as the numbers guy, so don't expect belly laughs, um, especially after dinner and things like that. My task is to address parts of the item number four and five that you gave to us and describe our past experiences working with public agencies where the key objective was to balance high quality development with maximizing owner return. It's in the DNA of our group to balance public goals of economic development, aesthetics, environmental sustainability, and social welfare with private financial and personal ones. We have all been involved with public-private ventures during our entire career, probably before they called them public-private ventures. Um, every project is different in its tensions, and defining the riverfront's particular challenges will be an early task, and we're ready to go on doing that immediately. Um, I will describe a couple of our projects that Hal's talked about a little bit later, which illustrate our experience in working with those um, public agencies and balancing high quality community development while guaranteeing financial return to the owners. When I first moved to Seattle, I was picked to be the executive director of the Pike Place Market. The core mission of my job was to balance the incredible demands of the merchants in the city with the financial needs to keep the markets solvent, which wasn't always very easy because people had been there a long time and they didn't like actually the idea of paying more rent. Um, surprising as that is. <laughs> that seven acre site included affordable and market rate housing over 125 day stalls with farmers and craftspeople, it was like having a farmer and um, craft market every day, and dozens of other small businesses. <coughs> Running the market was a high wire act, keeping the spirit of the market alive, which the market is known as the living room of Seattle, and assuring its economic sustainability <coughs> definitely lessens um, in learn in how to manage and develop a publicly scrutinized, much loved place. 
And those are applicable experiences to what we're talking about here, is the River District will become a much loved place. Our experience serving as developer for the Tacoma Housing Authority, the House talked about what the scale of that was, was the creation of a whole new neighborhood, just as the Riverfront Park is. So the 180-acre site was a little bit bigger, but it had 800 units of public housing on it that people actually lived in, and they were housing that was built during World War II. It wasn't very um, exciting housing. There was no structure. The, they, there was no insulation either, so there was no mold. Um, <laughs> the authority's goal was to increase the number of units from 800 to 2,000, creating a mixed income community with both affordable and market rate housing. However, we didn't know when we started that there would be enough money to to build the quality that we knew had to be built. You, you, had to, um, you had to build a high quality, especially for affordable housing, because you, don't always, you can't just keep refinancing it. So in the end, we creatively combined over eight sources of funds to complete the development, and we teamed up with the warehouses subsidiary quadrant to build the moderately priced for sale housing. We coordinated with the existing residents, local school districts. There are two schools at South Shan, a middle school and a middle and an elementary school. Um, the tribe, was, which were right next door, city utilities, and, and, and of course, private developers. Um, the result is a vibrant community, a game changer for Tacoma and the residents. Building a successful, multifaceted community is hard, but it's often contentious. The challenges are worth it when the end result is embraced by the whole community, and that's been our experience at everything we've done, but it's uh, at Salisham. Uh, Hal also talked about Thornton Creek, which was a private development, and it highlighted our skills in mediating different interests. It was a private development, on the, this was a private development on 12 acres, but it had been stalled for 10 years because of disagreements. The neighbors wanted figure out something to do with the um, open storm drain and that bisected the site, and the owners wanted to expand the shopping center. The owners were um, owned Northgate shopping mall. So this thing literally, and the city really wanted this thing built, but nothing was going nowhere. Everyone was very frustrated. We purchased the land and were able to work with the neighborhood, the city of Seattle, and Metro Mass Transit in designing a master plan, and then completing the construction of the site. This truly mixed-use project accommodated many interested needs. It was an active community, and interestingly enough, it was built over a park and ride that served 800 buses a day. So we had to negotiate with Metro Mass Transit to figure out who was going to pay how much of the parking, and um, we, came, we had meetings with 15, 20 people from them and came to a great conclusion. And then it was clustered along a Greenway Park which accommodated the stormwater overflow. So we believed in it. We were willing to do it. This is the kind of project we worked on, and, and we're very excited. And it's, as, as you've seen from the pictures, it's a fantastic project. Um, finally, as Hal has outlined, we've had a 20-year relationship with the University of Washington, where we have completed 13 projects at a cost of over a billion dollars. This is an example of our experience in developing communities with a long-term perspective. We worked with the University of Washington to build housing of every sort, although we're not building any on this site, and um, <laughs> include married student housing and um, singles housing and a, a variety of, of housing, as I mentioned. The eye was always on um, long-term durability. Um, I think we built maybe the first residential lead project in, in Washington in, in, our, in one of our first projects. Making more sustainable decisions about infrastructure materials is a public and private good. Possible when the owner is willing to make and able to make a longer term investment. Both Paul and Hal have talked about the unique role that the University of Oregon Foundation will have with River District development. The specifics of this involvement will be defined over time, but building a rich and varied community takes time to involve and benefits greatly from an owner being able to delay profits. Projects I've described are all true partnerships between public bodies, developers, neighborhoods, and the greater communities. We take great pride in creating developments that are extensions of the community, are financially successful, and push beyond what others are doing. 
The developer's role is to manage the entire process. We bring together the best possible team and work collaboratively to achieve our goals and business plan. We set a framework that allows each discipline to do their job and to explore creative solutions. We add our areas of expertise, financing, setting of goals, strategy, managing the various design consultants and contractors. We have assembled a regional team with local expertise that has worked successfully in creating thriving urban neighborhoods. We look forward to working with eWeb and the city to create the River District and connecting downtown to the river. Most importantly, with the foundation as the owner and capital partner, we know the vision of the River District can be realized. Uh, this, we believe the sale and uh, development of the Web Riverfront property is more than just a sale of a public asset. We believe it's a transfer of a public trust, and that's a, something that we believe that we are uniquely qualified to handle. The foundation has the financial strength, the long-term view, and a highly qualified team. We have a group of people who live in this community who share a vision with our friends and neighbors about the need to develop this property in a way that is world-class and still uniquely Eugene. We believe you have made the right decision making this process about choosing the right master developer. The property is too important to be left to a bid process. Establishing a price for this property will be complex, but we commit to working collaboratively with EWIP to establish a fair market value, a price that is fair to the ratepayers and allows for successful world-class development. And that is the end of our formal presentation and we look forward to your questions. Mr. Weinhold, and I apologize for pissing up your name earlier. Uh, I, I know Paul Weinberg from the past, so. Uh, <laughs> People have said worse, so. <laughs> you can mess up my name, just don't be just with Brown. Okay. <laughs> so with that, I want to go to our first question. So we have uh, 33 uh, minutes, and we have five questions from the commissioners. Uh, one, one of the groups that has sent today, and President Brown has the first question. And then we'll use the rest of the time to ask additional questions. Thank you. Well, thank you for the presentation. I'm very impressed. So, um, to, to my question is, I want you to share your impressions of key challenges to, to developing the property, and, and what are the potential barriers to take down, and how do you anticipate overcoming them? Um, I'll start to answer that question. <clears throat> this is a large site. It's got a hundred-year history. Uh, in terms of its uses over time, and there's a lot of information that is needed to be un to be understood before we can start um, putting the first uh, shovel in the ground for construction. Uh, we need to understand the environmental uh, uh, condition of the site, throughout the site, for its use in the development as we planned it. We need to understand the infrastructure that is there now and what that needs to stay and how that will impact future infrastructure that will go in its place. We need to understand and work with the city to define what is this, the public infrastructure that we put in place to support the overall development, where the park is going to be located, how big is the park plan, uh, the financing pieces that come together. In addition, we need to understand some of the financing tools that can be used, both local, state, and federal, that can help really make a successful project. And those are just the general site plan items. Um, in your existing office building, we have a lot of research to do on it as well if we're going to consider purchasing um, the, the building, the existing office building. I'll let Paul add anything that he might uh, go with that. I think that that pretty well covered it. Thank you very much. Great. Mr. Michelle? Your presentation was really thorough, so I apologize in advance if my question essentially asked you to be repetitive, but there you have it. Uh, so if you'd say a little bit more about creating the overall um, development concept, specifically how will it in, uh, invite the public to engage some of the unique and nearby features, including the river, the downtown, uh, and the University of Oregon, of course. John, would you like to take that one? Sounds like a softball to you. Sure, <laughs> and <Marco> too. <laughs> uh, so so we, and, uh, we talked about the importance of the streets. That's how you get to the river. So I think we made that pretty clear. Uh, the, I think that one, one question is, well, what kind of park, what, how, does, how does this add to Eugene's already pretty rich set of parks? What, what can it contribute? And uh, we didn't know, I mean, actually the, the question of how much park and what is it was part of the master plan, and we thought one of the great ahas of that process was the idea of a cultural landscape. We have a lot of passive green space, we have a wonderful riverfront trail, but what could this 
ad that's part of downtown. How does it do that? And the cultural aspect about the history of the city, um, what the site has been, what it can be in the future, how we work with the artifacts. You saw on the on the electric tower, I don't know if you'll let us put that sign on there, but it's not a lights <laughs> but, but working with elements, and uh, uh, we've been talking to Bring about elements that bridge pieces that we can use. So the idea of, of reusing and telling our story is, is really exciting, and we think that will add a dimension in our um, urban park structure and, and city park structure that'll be really worth having. I think um, we also know that um, we've all worked on many projects where we can bring our experience, but we're not necessarily just bringing ideas from other projects here. I think we're, we're working with and partnering with the community to make this a truly unique Eugene project. And, that, and you know, we see in the future that people from all over the region will come and see this development because of its uniqueness. And, as I said, you know, ideas come and experiences will be embedded in this, but it will really be a, a unique UG project. Thank you. Commissioner Well, <clears throat> uh, I got to say that uh, this is a very, very impressive uh, display here. Obviously, you are well prepared. Uh, so, I'm like uh, Commissioner Mattel, you've already answered my question, but <laughs> since, since I'm required to do this, then I'll send it at you one more time. <laughs> and my uh, question is, considering cultural diversity participation, how would you engage the local community to maintain support for your development plan and manage public expectations, uh, cite an example of uh, past projects if relevant? We have a um, um, cultural diversity of Eugene, and we've talked a lot about how we want to bring that history into the project. Um, we are also committed to providing opportunities for local contractors and design professionals, both women-owned and disadvantaged businesses, to participate in the project itself. And, and we, we do that as a commitment because we feel it's important, and we do it on every project. And the way we do that is we advertise when there's opportunities available to make sure that the businesses know that those opportunities are there. We put on training programs so that they know that the opportunities can, how they can participate. When it comes to putting together the, the construction packages in terms of work packages or the design work, we break it down into small enough elements that smaller companies can participate and they are not being asked to take on the challenge of a, of a large project that's beyond their capacity. And, we have had experience in doing that for 20 years now and have been very successful with that. We get no greater joy from that experience than seeing people that come in through that outreach effort, they participate in our project, and then you see them being successful in other project opportunities down the road. And we have seen that repeatedly through our efforts. So it is important to us, it's important to our character, and it's what we do on every project we work on. I appreciate that. Again, you've answered it before, but uh, I'm required. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Simpson. Well, it's pretty obvious your executive system, Victoria, sat you all down and decided what color shirt to wear. <laughs> <laughs> You're being interviewed as a master developer, so this question is for you, how? Um, pardon me. Yes. Um, please describe why and how you've incorporated various other developers and builders in other master developer projects, and if other local firms would be considered. I know you basically touched upon that. If you could elaborate on that, it's very important to our board that local resources be utilized. Clearly, you're from the University of Oregon, but I just want to hear again where are you? How you would emphasize that? So we, um, we are local, our team's local, we're reaching out um, and including local business and contractor opportunities. But we do not, as a master developer, our team do not have an expertise in every development type. So we would look for opportunities for t uh, hotels, uh, potentially office buildings where there are skill sets that aren't what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and attract that opportunities and go out and advertise to bring those in. A, a developer is, is some consider the last of the generalists. 
but we need specialists in very many parts of this. So where we don't have the expertise to do it ourselves, we will definitely reach out and bring in the local community uh, to make sure that there's opportunities there, but also get the expertise where it's needed. And I think Hugh can add to that, but clearly our attraction and what he's <coughs> talked about in bringing in local businesses that will, will rent or make this uh, development really um, seeing is what's most important to us. And he's got a great history of how that's happened here in Virginia. You can get out of Well, that, that's what I do, um, is talk to local people about what we're doing, and uh, in this case, hope, and we try to entice them in. Um, but I will say our history uh, in Eugene, we built Broadway Place uh, basically during a depression. We built uh, the U.S. Bank building uh, during bad times. Uh, we've always struggled and worked as hard as we could with local people. And this opportunity this time around is uh, beyond our wildest dreams that Eugene is exploding in many ways with creativity and entrepreneurism and there's success like we've never seen with local uh, entities. So uh, we're talking to everybody and uh, if we're selected we would widen the net and uh, go after anyone who we think would contribute to the district. So, uh, and I, I want to say that we also have plenty of experience with regional and national people, but we just think Eugene can probably do this and do it spectacularly. Fantastic, thanks. Over to you, Roger. Thank you, Commissioner Simpson. Uh, Commissioner Halverson could not be here this evening, but he'll be watching the, uh, the tape version of this. So I'm asking his question. This is the last of the five uh, pre-planned questions. So invariably, uh, public-private developments and frankly any major project will run into issues. Things can go south, things can start to run off the rails. And so my question is, what methods, tools, uh, solutions would you use to, um, one, identify those issues, uh, and two, to start to solve those? What would, what would be your approach to that? Paul, do you want to start with that one? Or you want me to? <laughs> I will be happy to start with it. I, I would uh, I would say first of all, it starts with the attitude and the commitment that, that we're in this for the long haul. We know that it's there aren't going to be it's not always going to be smooth. There are going to be difficulties. There are going to be challenges. But uh, we have a group of people who work together in the community, who work with other community members. So it's just going to be a process of literally working it out as far as specific. So uh, what has happened before. Mark, you might, or uh, You know, I, I think in the work we do, we're problem solvers, and none of these projects are easy. Um, you never get through a, a big project and have it easy. So it is part of our DNA, it's what we do. We look for creative solutions, um, we work with, with public and the local people to come up with good solutions, and we are in it for the long haul. It helps a lot to know we, we can't really go anywhere. We can't run away from a problem. This is where we live. So we, we do have to get this right, and we will uh, you know, find the solutions that get us to the finish line. I have an example uh, about being flexible. When we proposed uh, to save Lincoln School and build it into residences, we had many, many meetings with the neighborhood for more than a year. And early on, uh, there was quite a bit of opposition to our first proposal, which was to build really nice, fairly high-end housing. So there was a... <coughs> very memorable meeting when they said, we don't want that in our neighborhood, uh, we want uh, affordable housing. And that meeting we said, all right, we, we do that too. We, can, we could do that if that's what you want. And so uh, either way was fine with us because we wanted to save the school and do a nice job. And um, the mechanism to do that was less important than getting it done. As it turned out, the neighborhood changed its mind back and supported our original proposal. But we really could have done it either way, and we're willing to do it either way. Thank you. We're at 21 minutes, which gives us a time for some um, more organic questions. And I'd like to sort of cue, and I'd like to offer the first five to the city manager, uh, Mr. Reeves. I'll try to keep it to one. <laughs> In this case, uh, uh, it's kind of a statement, and I'll try to phrase it as a question. Because <laughs> part of the, uh, honestly, the most intriguing piece of this to me is, and what I think is the most transformational, you used the term earlier, is uh, the development of, uh, in your uh, FAQ, there's a couple statements you say here, saying strengthening our city, strengthen our community and the university, so I think that's true, but even more so, 
when you talk about the success of the UO in the city of Eugene and Lane, the UO is very much part of the Eugene fabric. It's good for Eugene and is good for the, and what is good for Eugene is good for the university, and what is good for the university is good for Eugene. I think in and of itself, that's the transformational statement. And so I'm pretty intrigued by that. And so, uh, so I'll phrase it a question. It's a bit of a softball, but. Uh, yeah, because we broke that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, can you just talk a little bit more about that? Because I do think that's a, uh, it's a pretty intriguing uh, comment that uh, isn't necessarily a part of our culture, uh, hasn't been so far. So I think it, that's the transformational piece to me of the proposal. Well, I, I think that, that your question is uh, multifaceted. I mean, the, we could get into the layers of what is the partnership between the city of Eugene and the university and all those things. But from our perspective at the foundation, uh, we, have, we see the opportunity to do something special in this community, something that, that you know, is an obvious, what well, we believe an obvious benefit for downtown, bringing the, bringing the water into play, we have the resources to do it that's going to benefit us for sure we believe financially and then it's certainly going to benefit the university because we're going to have housing that's affordable for the young faculty it's going to be a more vibrant place so that outcome that connection we believe is, a, is more than just an accident i mean it's 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 on purpose but you know again i would say that the important thing that we want people to know that this is not a university property. I mean, this is this is an intention for us to invest in the community for everybody's benefit. Around the commissioner's next round. Brown. Um, question. Um, whistle free zone. We've heard that before. Uh, would you like to comment on on that? Is it really important? Uh, if if so, uh, why? Hugh, do you want to take that one? No. <laughs> yeah, we think the whistle-free zone uh, is very important, and we think that uh, this time around we should be able to succeed with the kind of coalition and uh, mutual interests of everybody. So we think it's critically important. That's a very hard thing to mitigate. Uh, all the rest of it, I think we have good. Oh, I want to correct one thing. I think Hal said at one point that we plan to move the tracks. We actually plan to just move that one uh, that one crossing that you're already committed to. So we overreached it a little bit. I guess I, I just add one thing. I, you know, this is a community uh, community issue because it, it does happen to occur on this site, but it happens throughout throughout the community. And I know the city's working on it now. Um, there's work sessions set up to talk about this. There's opportunities for federal funding. So there, it looks like we're finally at a point where this community has some tools available to it to, to actually solve this problem. So it uh, happens to be coinciding with when we would love to develop the riverfront, but it, it, it really is sort of a unique time where there probably is a tool and some resources to actually solve this as a community-wide problem. Thank you. Commissioner Mattel and Ms. Parisi. Uh, so the University of Oregon owns the property adjacent just upstream, and I have heard um, some folks voice a concern that <clears throat> the needs uh, uh, of the one property might drive the timeline or the development on the other. So I wonder if you would address that. Well, we've never had that conversation. I've never had that conversation with the university. That's never come up. So um, I, I, it'd be hard to speculate on that. I mean, we have our own plan for this property, which is consistent with the master plan, which we're going to follow through with. So if that creates an opportunity for the university to do something for their benefit, to me, that's a separate issue. Does that answer your question? Uh, sort of. As a starting point, sure. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know it'll answer the concern, sort of generally pervasive out there in the community, that somehow or other, that there's some uh, that there might be a bigger vision that that, that we're not aware of. Uh, and I'm not saying I don't actually hold that vision. I'm actually asking it on behalf of people who have asked me, "What do you think about this piece?" I can tell you with uh, with absolute honesty and clarity that conversation is that has never even even close to happen. I mean, this our interest in this. We I certainly briefed the university on it some months ago. What we were doing and explained that it was not a campus project. That that we were doing something that, that isn't consistent with the master plan. And the university administration is very supportive of what we're doing for the benefits we talked about earlier that John mentioned. 
Ms. Bruce? I apologize if I was in a young coma and I missed you guys responding to this question, but we had asked as part of the presentation a specific question about the negotiation process and how you envision that moving forward and how you set up a process that results in a fair, accountable agreement between both agencies. Did I, can you elaborate, uh, and I apologize if you did res, you know, respond to that in particular, but uh, I, I don't think I heard it. I must have buried it in there somewhere. Um, the no, we have. Uh, we're looking at this as a as a collaboration on the value. That um, we realize that it's it's not going to be an easy task. It's very complex, and it's something that we intend to sit down with eWeb to come up with a fair market value. And again, as I said in my comments, I mean that a fair market value is something that's fair to the ratepayers and something that gives us the opportunity to be successful in this development. So it's. As many people in this room know, it's very difficult. It will be very difficult to value this land. That you could come up with some some extreme. So uh, we intend we have the resources to buy it, and we get probably some ideas scratched at the top of our head ideas of the range of the value. But it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of due diligence to come up with a value. And again, we expect that to be transparent and fair. Can I ask a follow-up um, In your original RFP proposal, um, part of the timeline spoke to developing, negotiating with UWeb at least back of this building. And what I heard today was really some exciting and innovative ideas about that really focus on redeveloping other portions of the site. So I guess what, it's, it, what I start wondering is, how do you prioritize those two very kind of complicated agreements? And, how do you stage them? How are they aligned? Well, the, the redevelopment is, a, is one separate issue. The sale of the building is another. If eWeb is interested in selling the building, we're interested in buying it and leasing it back to eWeb. Uh, if eWeb is not interested in selling that, then that's fine too. Those are, the, to me, they're, they're uncoupled. But if you want to do both, we'll do both. And if not. Is there a priority for you? Um, like, does one stage the other? No. The, well, I would say the priority for us is the redevelopment of the of the land. It's not to purchase the building, but we're willing. I'm just throwing it Yeah, you obviously illustrated you have a brilliant team put together for the development. But I'm wondering who's who's the lead developer? Who's the point? I am. Yeah. So Spectrum Development will be the point person on leading the development team. Uh, we don't do it on our own. We have a whole team here to support it, but I'm the point person that brings that organization together and sets it up on how we go about doing our job. So I'll be working with these other close other members, but I'm the point person on the development efforts. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on why you decided to go with the north to south staging. I'm a little concerned about the steam uh, and the steam quarter being left to the end. You, you, just, you mentioned a few things about some interim occupancy there, but uh, I feel that the site needs to be anchored at both ends, so, uh, but I'm not a specialist, so if you can convince me why it's best to do the north to south rather than anchoring a bill toward the center, I'd appreciate your I'll start with that one and I'll look Mark out to it. Um, we need to create a place. We need to have a there there. Um, and we need to build on the momentum so that people can get a vision of what the river district will look like. And we feel that that can come about um, most rapidly in the market quarter. And that's because of the reasons Mark gave in terms of some of the existing streets are already there with the sidewalk improvements and the other right of way. Uh, we haven't uh, dove into the details to know if the other infrastructure pieces that need to service that are also there. But we do know there's a lot more work to be done in the steam plant yet. And if we spread out our efforts too much, what we don't want to do is spread it too thin and then have it stall and not create that same buzz. So we really feel like we can service that area quickly and move it and get it filled up and move into the rest of the district. Um, if we can dive into the steam plant building and really get to understand it better and the cost to uh, deal with the seismic issues and some of the other cleanup issues on it and get an interim use that can activate it, you know, we'd like to do that. Having eyes on the street, 
and some activity there is it better than having it vacant, but we think our new development efforts will start the month of quarter. Yeah, okay. yeah, I guess the one thing I'd add, you know, we understand that you've invested a lot in the steam plant too. We walked through that building uh, well, but during the master planning process and um, it was sort of a nightmare to consider how you might approach that building. There was asbestos issues, you had your bunker fuel tank that had to be cleaned up, and you've done actually a lot of the heavy lifting of, of cleaning up that project. So I, I do think there are opportunities now with the work you've done to accelerate that probably faster than if you hadn't done that work. Um, there is the challenge of a rail crossing that has to move, and that's something that has a third party that um, you know we would have to work with. Uh, the ultimate plan is to have that aligned with the end of 8th Street and um, working with railroads can be slow and long processes. It doesn't mean we couldn't do something on an interim basis with that building, and I think that's what we're looking at. We do want to energize that end of the site as soon as we possibly can. Thank you. Yeah, a couple of different questions. Yeah. Thanks very much for the presentation. It's very intriguing. So uh, two uh, questions. First, can you elaborate a bit more about the relationship between uh, the Euro Foundation and the developer, are you looking at forming some kind of a partnership? Uh, will the developer function with this to develop on behalf of the Euro Foundation just so we can understand that? And second, uh, curious about the uh, reliance on, the, on restaurant well, which is an intriguing concept. We've heard on um, a number of occasions that restaurants that are uh, not uh, double loaded uh, areas uh, or the, uh, challenging climates like the Northwest sometimes have a lot of turnover don't succeed. So uh, I'm uh, curious about your response to how pivotal is restaurant row in the way it's been uh, laid out to the project or is there flexibility there? Paul, do you want to answer the first part and then we'll let John to speak yeah. to the restaurant row? I suppose the first one is a fee developer relationship. It is. Yes. <laughs> And John, do you want to talk about the importance of restaurant row? We've well, had yeah, that discussion. The, the, right. uh, if many of you were involved in the master planning process, and the idea of bringing activity to the river edge was a was a bit controversial. How do you do that? We want to have a beer on the river, but we don't want to have a street on the river. So it was a very important, uh, appropriately scaled uh, connector to the river. Now, does that translate to uh, is the development project um, we're talking about that it's not going to be the easiest part for sure and there are real questions about well how do you get a restaurant to work on two sides there are plenty of examples um, around the northwest of restaurants working partly depends on how good the food is but the, um, the in the plan and in the in the, the land use phase uh, there would be understand that, that uh, we understood that flexibility was really important there are other if you Read the fine print, it's kind of boring, but there are other uses <coughs> of it besides restaurants. It's, we call it restaurant room because it that's the goal. Um, but there's flexibility, and obviously we need to work through that. I take a little shot at it. Um, we own buildings with restaurants in them and other uses, and we we're, we're well aware of the challenges of, of restaurants, and uh, um, on, and so. It's a great question because they're a tricky use and they're a difficult uh, economic uh, thing to make work and also essential, I think, to the core of this area. So the first time I looked at the, mar the plan, I had the same reaction you're having as well. Can you do that? And um, we, we really want to work with that, uh, the difficulties there and the challenges and do something really special. And uh, it's a core piece of, of our thinking and we've thought about it a lot. Commissioner Mann. Yeah, thank you. Uh, during the presentation, you said something that was that really was intriguing and caught my ear. Uh, you had mentioned a rate payer. Uh, you, the only team uh, presenters that have come to the table and mentioned the, with the rate payer in mind. And since you mentioned the rate payer, I was wondering what what benefits are you or how do you perceive that this is going to benefit? the rate payer because that's very important to us as that's what we are our, our core foundation what we're about. Well I'm a rate payer. <laughs> <laughs> a 
lot of us are, a lot of us here are great mayors. <laughs> so, yeah, enough about me. Um, now we recognize the responsibility entrusted in this board that they have to represent the, the ratepayers for EWA, and uh, that means getting a fair price and a, a price that they can that you can justify to the ratepayers because that's your constituency. So we recognize that and the importance of that. I appreciate that. Uh, again, that's something that never that didn't surface earlier during the presentation. Then to hear that uh, is very refreshing, and I, I really appreciate that that you would even make that part of your presentation to even mention that. That's very important. Thank you, Mr. Brock. Just a point of clarification. I've heard some concern that if this is conveyed to the university foundation, that there'll be an issue with taxation. And can you clarify for the group whether or not you're a 501c3 or what if, if we can make to you fee simple title, would it not be taxed or would it be taxed? We are a 501c3, but this is a would be considered a for profit enterprise, so there wouldn't be any tax benefit to us that, that would happen to us and not happen to another developer. Thank you. And, and all the there would be uh, the property would be that property tax would be received. Correct. I'm not seeing any other questions from the team. Uh, I hope the team will allow me to ask a follow up or clarification if that's okay. Um, I'm not cue jumping here. Um, so I hope, I, I think it was you were talking about the coupling or decoupling of the headquarters, for example. And that's just a, looking at the map up here, that's the river quarter. I just want to make sure. I want to make sure I'm interpreting their answer properly. So please correct me if I'm. If I heard it was flexibility. I might attempt to negotiate. I heard, I heard flexibility. It can, be, it can be coupled in or out. So even though it's drawn within the river quarter, that's really illustrative at this point. But if it was broken out, it, the, the, the quarter concept still could still could survive. Absolutely. Yes. But it's not. It's. For, the, for, for working purposes, it's been defined as river quarter, but it could be decoupled if necessary. It doesn't become an eighth; it's still a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> we just want to know where we go. <laughs> I think, regardless of who owns it, it's part of that that district. So there's a lot of employment here. There's people that will benefit from the district. So we we view it as we don't have hard line boundaries necessarily. <clears throat> you guys are part of it, regardless of who owns that. Thank you for clarification. Anything else from the team? That's it. Commissioners? City Manager? No, sir. Okay. Uh, so I hold, it, we have two minutes and a half, and I'm going to turn it over to you for any final words you'd like to make in the two and a half minutes that you spent from your team. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I think the only thing that we would like to say is thanks for the opportunity. Uh, we, we have put a lot of thought into this. We've put a lot of work into it. And uh, because we believe it can be something special for this community. So that is all we have. Thank you very much.